CTO, and subsequently the CMCO, and now the RC, RMCO, um, domestic violence cases in Malaysia have been on the rise. And organizations such as the Women's Aid Organization, WAO, and the Women's Center for Change, WCC, have reported increases in the number of calls and cases they have received during the MCO. So today, today we have invited some of our panelists. Um, we've got Fatlina Binti Datuk Siddiq of Fatlina Siddiq and Associates, and you ran chair in the WAO. Um, to uh, to discuss issues of access to justice for violence uh, for victims of domestic violence during periods of restricted movement and social distancing. We also hope to have Hani Tan from Tan Law Practice join us. And I just believe she's trying to sign in because she had a meeting that overran. So she should be joining us rather quickly. Um, so this is a live panel. And for those of you who are tuning in, we will have a Q&A session right at the end. So please pop in your questions into the Q&A box below and we will pick that up later. So let's just give Honey a couple more minutes to join us and then we will get started. Ah, great, perfect. Hi Honey, welcome to the panel. Good to see you. Sorry you're on mute. You might want to uh, unmute yourself so we can get started. Oh, hi. Have you, are we on with all the other participants or is this still us? Um, the attendees have signed in, so we do have attendees watching us, and I've just about finished the introduction while waiting for you to sign in. I'm really glad that you're oh, able to I'm join so in. I'm sorry. Was just like no worries. That's fine. Totally understand. So um, I was just introducing the panelists, and I've introduced you, um, Hani Tan from Tan Law Practice. Um, so perhaps without further ado, we can just get started um, with the session. So my first question is directed to Ren Cheng who represents um, the WAO, the grassroots organization that is in the front line of the fight against domestic violence. Now, Renshin, from your perspective, um, and in, in general terms, what exactly is domestic violence, and, and why and how does it happen? Perhaps you'd like to share? Thank you. I want to go over maybe just a few quick examples uh, of, of, of scenarios, and I want you to think whether to you does this constitute domestic violence or does it does it have elements of domestic violence um so first example my partner dislikes my family and friends and discourages me from seeing them i haven't seen my family and friends for two months so this is a scenario someone's facing is, is that is that abuse or does that have elements of abuse just something to think about Another scenario, I earn my own income, but I need to ask for my partner's permission before buying anything. My partner also monitors my bank account. Is that abuse? Another scenario, my partner sends me at least 20 texts a day to check where I am and who I am with. Another example, usually my partner is loving and caring but when in a bad mood, he lashes out, shouts, and breaks things that belong to me. So these are just uh, short examples of, of behaviors um, that may or may not uh, constitute domestic violence. Um, uh, and so what, what do we look at when we actually think of um, domestic violence? I think the first thing to note is there's a power imbalance uh, between two persons. Uh, that leads to one person exerting control over the other. Uh, and that control can take various forms. It could be in the form of physical violence. Uh, it could be threats. Uh, it could be using emotional means. Uh, it could be financial control. It could be social isolation uh, and many other um, uh, uh, instances. So if we look back to some of the examples that we highlighted, um, we saw social isolation. Uh, you know, one person, in the first example, haven't, hasn't seen their family and friends for two months. So what, what is this, what's the implication of this? This means this person does not have a support system to seek help. And also this person becomes more dependent on the partner. Um, we saw another example of uh, financial control. Uh, even though someone owns, uh, has their own income, but the partner actually monitors and controls finances. Um, 
And of course, uh, the last example um, was an example of a bit more glaring example of, of abusive behavior, uh, lashing out, shouting, breaking things. Uh, these are things that can exert one's control over the other. And, and the last two uh, criteria that, that I think is important to highlight in, 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 in cases of domestic violence is that these things, these behaviors are normally uh, repeated. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's not a one off event usually. Uh, you know, partner could be doing a series of these things. All these examples I gave, it could be of the same person actually, where the, the partner does a series of things uh, over, you know, weeks, months, years, uh, in order to exert their control over um, this, the, the victim or survivor. Uh, and the last element I would like to highlight is, is fear. Uh, I think domestic violence um, often, and, and in fact, it's, it's a, a key characteristic of domestic violence, it's causing fear to, uh, to, the, to the survivor or, or um, victim. So to sum it up, um, uh, domestic violence involves, uh, uh, stems um, primarily from a power imbalance between two persons, and you can sort of think of that in a larger term uh, in terms of gender relations. Um, where men, um, uh, sort of in a patriarchal system, men tend to feel that they have more power. Um, so that power imbalance is, uh, is then exploited by one partner to exert control over the other using a a various sets of, of behaviors, including physical, uh, emotional, financial, social, etc. This pattern is repeat causes fear uh, in, in the survivor. Okay, thanks, Ranchan. That's a very interesting um, and a very useful overview because it appears that the main um, criteria for domestic violence isn't something that is immediately visible all the time, right? You know, power and balance, element of control, repetition and fear. Unless there is um, a physical manifestation of that, it could be difficult to sort of pinpoint when exactly, you know, is this the situation of um, domestic violence. So that's, thank you for that very helpful um, overview. Now I'd like to just sort of turn the time to the lawyers to ask about their views on domestic violence from a, from a legal perspective. Um, perhaps, Fatlina, you could share first from a Sharia law perspective. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for having me, uh, especially to share with all of you the position of Sharia uh, regarding domestic violence. So I would, uh, I would start with um, sharing my slide. Uh, please bear with me um, that this is um, these are not uh, academic slides, it's just um, uh, notes yeah, for everyone to share. Okay, uh, so please bear with me. Can you, sh uh, can you sh see my notes there? Okay, all right. Okay, basically, Hannah uh, and everyone, um, there's no specific uh, term of domestic violence in Islam or in Sharia. Um, but the Sharia actually, uh, we identify the behaviors consistent with domestic violence under the umbrella of oppression. Yeah, so I brought, oppression is a broad category that includes any type of injustice against another person and is clearly prohibited in Islam. So the concept in the Quran that believers, men and women, are protectors of one another, establish the nature of the relationship between men and women at the societal level, and is supposed to be applied at the family level as well. So at the family level, oppression is defined as any act that violates the specific boundaries delineated by God to protect spousal and children's rights. So I, I agree with uh, Renchu just now that when we talk about domestic violence, we talk about uh, power imbalance as well. So um, the general categories of uh, the domestic violence, uh, oppression mentioned in the Al-Quran include aggression, yeah? uh, wrongdoing, harsh words or treatment and inflicting harm or injury. So actions that fall into any of these categories are violence of the Islamic values of justice, equality, freedom, uh, mercy and forgiveness. So these behaviors, these uh, oppressive behaviors are inconsistent with the qualities of God-conscious people. So family structure, gender roles, marriage and divorce laws, reconciliation and financial matters are among the issues that are addressed in great detail in the Quran. 
Um, throughout the many verses discussing the issues, uh, there are common themes which emphasize the connection between justice and piety, accountability to God, and the importance of uh, preventive measures to avoid injustice and oppression. And I would like to share with all of you, there's a legal maxim used by the Muslim juries, uh, to interpret and judge according to Islamic law can be translated as there should be neither harming nor reciprocating harm or in Arabic, la uh, darar wa la dirar. So oppression occurs when mercy and justice are ignored. Uh, Islam defines oppression as transgressing limits or boundaries defined by God, and it prohibits oppression at all levels of society. So that is the first position of uh, domestic violence uh, in Sharia. Um, now, um, let's see uh, what is domestic, whether domestic violence um, has a position in our Islamic family law in Malaysia. So firstly, um, every Muslim woman, uh, they are protected by a uh, taklik. Yeah? Taklik is the promise made by the husband during the solemnization of the marriage, um, except for one state in Malaysia. That is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that is police, where taklik is not practiced by the Islamic authority in that particular state. So it was stipulated in taklik that one of the main protection for women is to secure herself from being abused physically by the husband. So the taklit was stated or mentioned clearly at the back of the marriage certificate. So every woman, Muslim woman in this country will uh, have this copy of taklit uh, and the promise made by the husband uh, during uh, the solemnization of the marriage not to abuse or harm her during the marriage. Yeah? So taklit uh, is pronounced by the husband during the solemnization of the marriage after the age of Kabul witnessed by two male witnesses and signed by the husband. So the exact wording yeah, would be um, the one that uh, I have lighted. Melakukan darar terhadap tubuh badan. So it can be translated as uh, not doing harm to the body, uh, physically, uh, body of the wife. Yeah? Uh, a married woman, yeah, um, especially if the husband did any harm to the body during uh, physical harm to the body during the marriage, she can apply under section 50 of the Islamic family law. It was under tatli or stipulation. So a married woman may, a woman may if entitled to a divorce under in pursuance of the terms of tatli certificate made upon a marriage, apply to the court to declare that such divorce has taken place. So uh, the court, will examine whether the husband has made that promise, has made that public and um, after uh, inquiry made by the court um, and the court satisfied yeah, that the divorce is valid according to Kum Shara, then uh, the, the wife can uh, uh, apply under this section. Yeah? So that's the first uh, posi uh, second position and then the next position is uh, section 53, yeah? order for resolution of marriage or FASA. This is a very interesting uh, section, actually, because uh, any woman or man who has been abused uh, by their partner uh, can um, apply um, FASA or dissolution of marriage under this section. So it applies to both parties, uh, the husband or the wife, yeah, um, due to domestic violence during the marriage. So in this section, it's stated there, a woman or man, as the case may be, married in accordance with Hukum Sharat, shall be entitled to obtain an order for the dissolution of marriage of FASA on any one or more of the following grounds, namely, yeah, section 53H. This section 53H of um, order for dissolution of marriage specifically mention on cruelty. Uh, so cruelty, uh, we can actually interpret uh, this is regarding domestic violence, that the husband or wife treats him or him with cruelty, that is to say in Te'elia, number one, habitually assaults her or him or makes her or his life miserable by cruelty or conduct. So habitually assault means uh, mental uh, abuse or emotional abuse and makes her or his life miserable by cruelty or conduct is physical abuse. Second, uh, associates with women or men of evil repute or leads what according to Hukum Shara is as a famous life. Three, forces the wife to lead an immoral life. Four, is, this is about uh, property, disposes of her or his property. 
uh, or prevents he or him from exercising he or his her or his legal rights over it, and then obstruct he her or him in the observance of her religious obligation or practice. So if you uh, find that your husband obstruct, yeah, you know, or actually doing um, uh, abstain you from practicing your religion, uh, so under this section you can apply for fasa. Or he, if he has more wife than one, does not treat her uh, according with the requirement of hukumja. This is for polygamy. So all this situation falls under uh, cruelty. Uh, that is, uh, we consider as domestic violence under the fasa. And then uh, the last position, I guess, is in polygamy. Yeah, this is very interesting because why uh, uh, every man or any man uh, apply. Uh, for uh, polygamy, uh, they should observe uh, this um, condition before um, the application um, submitted to the court. So, one receive, uh, one the court receive the application, the court may grant the permission apply uh, if the court satisfied that for one of the condition is that the proposed marriage, whether it's a second marriage, third marriage, or fourth marriage would not cause darar shari to the existing wife or wives. Yeah? So darar shari under section 2, interpretation of Islamic family law, means harm according to what normally recognized by hukum shara, affecting a wife in respect of religion, life, body, mind, dignity or property. So if you propose, if a man propose um, a marriage, yeah, but yeah, uh, uh, during the marriage, um, uh, there's harm eh, done to the wife affecting her body means physically abused by the husband or mind mentally abused by the husband so the court uh, might not eh, proceed with the permission to allow the polygamy marriage so Hana that is the I think um, the three position um, that uh, includes in the share if it's like family law regarding um, domestic violence so the word domestic violence is not there uh, basically, but uh, we go by uh, cases. Um, there's oppression generally. Then uh, we have um, darar in, in taklik and fasa with all the situation, and then polygamy. So that's all for round one, Hannah. Back to you. All right. Thank you, Fadila. I think that was a very, very clear and structured approach to how um, the Sharia law aims to protect both parties in an intimate yes. uh, relationship, yes. male or female. Um, and also the protection is not just to sort of the physical well-being of the person, but it's also to their property and to their psychological well-being. Yes. So thank you very much for sharing. Um, now, now, honey, it, it would be great to hear your perspective on what is domestic violence in law and how is it usually applied in matrimonial proceedings and in criminal matters? Um, hi everyone, I'm so sorry I was late just now, uh, but it was really interesting hearing what Farlina had to say, especially about polygamy. So I'm going to start by talking about domestic violence uh, from a perspective of law that is applicable to all Malaysians first, whether you're Muslim or non-Muslim. Um, so the first one I'm going to touch on is uh, the criminal law part. So offences under the Domestic Violence Act is most usually read together with the penal code. So um, just now, Ren Chung had talked a little bit about uh, what's domestic violence, but in law, um, even a threat to uh, commit some kind of physical injury to an, uh, someone who's a family member uh, will constitute uh, domestic violence. So is the actual physical violence, the threat of violence, um, and something which most people don't actually think about as domestic violence is, uh, you know, destroying property, even to annoy, which means make somebody angry, um, is also domestic violence. I think when I tell my clients that they're, they're actually quite shocked that, you know, uh, commonly now we'll be like smashing the iPad, the phones, you know, uh, those sorts of behavior is actually domestic violence. Um, the other one is, of course, uh, if you force somebody to do something that they, they in law, um, have a right to say no to. Huh? So this is where we always say for the women's groups, it's really weird that, you know, uh, if a stranger rapes somebody, then, then it's considered a crime. But if a husband rapes a wife, it's not a crime. Because if you look at our, our rape provision, um, sexual intercourse with a husband, there's a marital exception. So that's not rape. 
So the wife cannot say no to vaginal intercourse, but she can say no to you know uh, anal intercourse and and uh, oral sex. So that those sort of things uh, she can say no to. Um, and quite interestingly, like recently there have been a few amendments to the uh, DDA. So if you cause somebody psychological you know abuse, including uh, emotional injury, that is also um, domestic violence. So quite often uh, that can be coupled together with uh, you know using money as, as a way to control someone. And sometimes that, that kind of control can be very extreme and, and that's not very good and that is domestic violence. Um, giving somebody uh, intoxicating substances when they, they don't know about it, uh, that also constitutes domestic violence. Um, and and uh, let me see. The other interesting ones is uh, threatening the victim with the intent to cause the victim uh, to fear for uh, her safety uh, of the property, right? So it's not now the, the it's been expanded so that you don't only have to fear, uh, you know, uh, injury to yourself, but also to, to, uh, to property. Uh, or dishonestly misappropriating the victim's property, which causes the victim to suffer distress or financial loss, you know? Um, and you, you find that actually quite, quite often, um, especially in small family businesses, you know, where they, uh, you know, one spouse will, you know, forge the other spouse's uh, signature and, and cash out money or withdraw money. And checks maybe now going out of like, you know, it's like a dodo already maybe. But, you know, with, with your password and all that, you can actually do transfers online. Uh, and, and that sort of movements of money, uh, which is not done by consent, can also constitute... Uh, domestic violence um, if it causes the, the victim to suffer distress. So that's, that's kind of like the, the criminal part of it. Um, and the more interesting thing, if the uh, perpetrator is convicted of uh, domestic violence, there is a provision in the penal code, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is section 326A, if you look at the penal code, if you are convicted of uh, an offence uh, perpetrated by a spouse, uh, the, the sentence is actually double, right? So if you are sentenced to one year jail by virtue of 326A, your sentence is automatically uh, double and it's, it's mandatory, yeah? so it's, it's not discretionary. So that, that kind of like more or less takes care of uh, the criminal aspect of uh, domestic violence in a nutshell. The other aspect of criminal law that applies to Muslims and non-Muslims is in the area of torts. Huh? So uh, torts, I'm not sure whether we have non-lawyers here. So torts are civil wrongs and your remedies most usually are damages, which means monetary compensation. But more importantly for uh, survivors of domestic violence is the injunction, right? You want to stop uh, the perpetrator from actually repeating uh, the acts of domestic violence. So the tort will be the usual assault, uh, which is, is the uh, tort of assault is basically putting you in fear of injury and all that. But uh, battery is the actual touching. Um, and then you also have harassment. Uh, you have... Um, we are trying, I mean, stalking is technically not, not even a, uh, not a, not a tort, nor is it a crime in Malaysia. Uh, but we, we actually do sometimes split that in, in, in our uh, divorce proceedings. So I'm now going to leave the area of tort and criminal aspects of domestic violence, which is applicable to all Malaysians, and move on to uh, the, the part about matrimonial proceedings, which is only applicable to uh, non-Muslims. So Fadlina just now had a really interesting presentation uh, on, on Muslim uh, uh, matrimonial proceedings. So you can use domestic violence uh, in, in a, a section of the uh, LRA where you are trying to prove the breakdown of the marriage. Huh? So there's only one ground for divorce in Malaysia is the fact that the marriage has irretrievably broken down and you prove it four ways. One is adultery, the other one is separation for two years and uh, the third is uh, desertion for, for uh, two years. But the one that's uh, where you would place domestic violence is the part B where it says that, you know, the but uh, the respondent has behaved in such a way that it's unreasonable to expect the petitioner to live uh, you know, uh, with, with him or her. Lah, huh? So that's where you will put your domestic violence. So, um, and the other interesting thing about the Domestic Violence Act is that it also allows the claiming of damages. 
um, for, for domestic violence. Huh? So in one of our cases at the high court level, uh, the court did find that uh, uh, there was domestic violence, number one, and she made um, some orders as to damages. Um, but at the, at the Court of Appeal, that was overturned. That part of the, the, the judgment was overturned. Unfortunately, the Court of Appeal did not write a decision. So we are not very clear exactly why that was overturned. So we are still right now, at the moment, we are also uh, continuing to, to put, uh, to plead uh, domestic violence as part of behaviour. And we are also still pleading for damages. Uh, and, and, and we are trying to litigate and, and build the jurisprudence and see how far this, this uh, area of the law can go. So I'm going to start right now. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Ani. That, that was very interesting and it was definitely a, a lot to digest. Um, so I really appreciate the panel's given us an overview on domestic violence in Malaysia and the laws around that. Now let's sort of like zero in on the impact of the pandemic and how have victims of domestic violence been impacted by COVID-19 and the MCO, especially in terms of access to justice. Um, now, Fadina, perhaps you could share about the responses of the Sharia courts in the states that you practiced in um, for the period of the MCO. Yes, uh, thank you, Hannah, again. Uh, this is my um, observation um, during uh, the MCO um, uh, on uh, how has uh, COVID-19 uh, and the MCO has um, affected victims of uh, domestic violence. So uh, the, the lockdown, yeah, the MCO has left um, the vulnerable group completely at risk, especially women. So there's no escape from their abuses during quarantine. We've been observing these issues um, from the first PK, uh, from the first phase of uh, MCO until now. And um, actually, most of the victim has been in hassle of um, in a hassle marriage yeah, uh, before the MCO. Some of them has even filed for divorce. Uh, prior to MCO, but due to MCO, uh, the court has adjourned uh, the matter. So, um, in fact, um, the United Nations um, has urged all the government to put women safety first as they respond to the pandemic. So, trapped at home, um, and um, most of um, uh, the academician, uh, especially expert in domestic violence, has turned into um, domestic violence um, during pandemic. Uh, they they, they, they uh, call it um, intimate terrorism. Yeah? So intimate terrorism refers to intimate partner violence during pandemic. Uh, it can be seen as um, the situation, uh, isolation from friends, family and, and employment, constant surveillance, strict or detailed rules of behavior, restrictions on access to such basic necessities as food, clothing, and etc. So um, intimate terrorism is the term used uh, by the United Nations and most of the uh, expert in domestic violence, um, especially, specifically during this pandemic. So Hana, stay at home does not mean you are safe at home. Yeah? So the lockdown is a huge downside for victims exposed um, to their abuses. Um, and then um, we observe that uh, access to helpline and shelter home, especially in help in helpline, yeah? um, Rancho uh, can confirm this, part in um, numbers for domestic violence. There was nowhere to desperate for desperate to go. Shelters could not take them because the risk of infection was too great, and there's no court proceeding except for telecounseling and legal consultation. So during this phase, we have observed um, the situation, um, and um, uh, due to this risk, uh, due to this situation, so the the Sharia court has um, responded yeah, um, by getting approval and permission from um, Majlis Keselamatan Negara and KKM, of course, to approve their SOP to operate uh, the service during pandemic. So this is a very interesting part um, of uh, Sharia Court, where actually um, they open uh, for limited cases during this uh, pandemic uh, situation. So uh, JKSM, our uh, Sharia Judicial Department, um, are developing a proper mechanism to effectively respond to this problem. Uh, and um, we uh, and after the approval, yeah, uh, uh, the Sharia Court has opened, uh, but only to limited cases. And one of the cases that um, uh, categorized as um, urgent and um, on urgent basis is the filing of fasa, a divorce 
um, dissolution of marriage on the ground of domestic violence. Um, what you have to do is just come to the court with the police report and the medical report yeah, to be attached together and you can file it during the pandemic. Yeah? Uh, this is a very interesting approach taken by the Sharia court just to address the issue of domestic violence during pandemic. So it has give um, a, a big relief actually for the Muslim woman um, uh, under the situation uh, that they can actually file uh, for divorce under FASA or mutual divorce during this pandemic. So uh, today um, we have the Sharia Court has opened um, completely open uh, and operate um, full service. So uh, every uh, cases um, we can attend every cases uh, as usual, uh, starting from ninth uh, June. Yeah. It's fantastic. So, yes. So there's no more urgent on urgent basis. But during that pandemic, we have also. Um, uh, entertain few cases on injunction during to uh, due to domestic violence. So that was the situation during the first, second, and third phase of MCO okay. and the approach taken by the Sharia court. Thank that's you. that's really great to hear. I mean, it's really great to hear that there was that balancing consideration between public health safety and safety for yeah. people at home. So I'm really glad to hear that. Um, now, turning over to Honey, what was your experience doing the MCO and how have the new restrictions affected your client's ability to access justice and, and what were some of your approaches to try and mitigate some of the negative impacts? Well, um, I think once again, the, the Sharia courts have uh, you know, speeded ahead. Um, I, I'm lucky in the sense that I, I uh, serve on the Family Law Committee of the Malaysian Bar and I've been asking the my fellow members, uh, you know, and, and they're from all over Malaysia. So I'm asking them, did they deal with any cases uh, in the civil courts, uh, the civil divorce courts, uh, uh, in terms of uh, domestic violence during this uh, MCO, RMCO, CMCO periods and all that? And, and essentially, uh, the answer is that no one actually went to court on this. Um, I think it, it has to do with, with the way in which uh, the civil law practice works because um, the courts have been open and they say that in matters of urgency, uh, we can always file what we, what we call a certificate of urgency so that we can be heard by a judge um, you know, Im immediately or very soon. The only problem is that um, I think for most lawyers, when we want to file a certificate of urgency, it, it's, to us, it's actually quite a high standard to meet. Uh, something must be like super seriously um, wrong. So it's not to say that domestic violence is not urgent or important, uh, but I think most of us, either the clients didn't come back and want to take any further action um, to go to court, or the other thing about lawyers also ourselves in the sense that um, we don't think it's that urgent that you want to file a certificate of urgency. So this sort of procedure is, is quite different from how the uh, English courts have been handling it over, I mean, their version of the, the MCO period. Huh? So the, the, the phrase, the, the word that they use is essential. So they ask the question is, uh, is this case essential to be heard during this lockdown period, right? Um, and, and they have actually gone ahead and, and heard applications and all. But... Um, so from a wide, kind of like a spread of uh, lawyers who are practicing family law throughout Malaysia, uh, the answer has been like no one has actually gone to court on, on this issue during the, the COVID uh, period. And I, I, I suspect a lot of it is because of the, the term urgency versus essential. So I think I'm going to stop here because there's nothing much more to add and, and uh, I'll take questions later on this. Okay, okay. Well, that's very interesting to hear, especially sort of the, the contrast between how the two different um, regimes sort of like move forward. Um, now, turning over to a civil society perspective, um, from the WAO's perspective, what sort of changes in your strategies or approaches did you take to support domestic violence victims during the MCO? And, and would you consider maintaining these new approaches moving forward after the MCO? I think there are two um, fundamental changes that happen um, during MCO. Uh, first, um, or that we had anticipated um, at the start of the MCO, the first is um, uh, increase in cases. Uh, so we, we knew from, um, I guess, past uh, experiences with uh, similar situations, well, not quite similar to this, but um, other kind of crises, that domestic violence uh, has been 
there's evidence to say that domestic violence would increase during um, such times, and and the reasons uh, could be um, various. So you know, you're just at home more, so the opportunities for um, a conflict and abuse is higher. Um, increased stress, um, in financial stress, um, other kinds of daily stress could contribute towards uh, uh, abusive incidents. Um, so all sorts of issues, uh, lack of uh, to escape, uh, to get help. You know, so all these are factors that could contribute to uh, an increase in, in cases. And in fact, we did see um, a huge increase in, in cases uh, 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 of domestic violence. Um, we typically, typically get about 250 to 300 uh, inquiries monthly. Um, during the month of April, May, we saw that jump by more than three times to over 800 um, a month. So, um, so, so that just shows uh, the reality, uh, this uh, uh, anticipation become a reality that is a huge increase in, in caseload of domestic violence. That's number one. And the second big change is, of course, um, with COVID and um, related uh, movement control order, um, the whole status quo is disrupted uh, in terms of access to services. So uh, it, either accessing services through the government or, or through NGOs like WAO. Uh, so opportunity for, uh, for physical contact uh, to get services through um, sort of uh, direct means has uh, been stopped basically or, or severely limited. So uh, bec uh, anticipating these two changes, uh, we did a number of things. Um, one is increase our capacity to provide services, uh, simple as that. So uh, uh, from having um, about six full-time social workers and um, about 12 or 15 volunteers, we um, increased by probably about 50% uh, by, uh, by shifting around internal resources, by sort of getting more volunteers to come on board, um, by temporarily bringing some people back to the team. Um, so that's number one. Uh, number two is we increase our ser uh, service hours to 24 hours a day, uh, knowing that you know maybe uh, besides being an, uh, that there being an increase in um, uh, incidences or cases generally, it, it might be harder for someone to contact us during certain hours of the day. Uh, you know they might have to wait until uh, late at night before they have the opportunity to um, to call or to reach out for help. So we extended our all the hotline hours to 24 hours. Um, we also did a lot of um, uh, outreach, you know, knowing that people would have uh, a lot of questions and there may be uh, confusion during uh, the uh, movement control period. What has services available? Are just operating? Can I get help from the police? So we did uh, a lot of outreach to try and clarify these processes to survivors. Uh, so that's kind of on one hand, on related services and, and outreach. And, and the other is on um, the nature of our services itself. So we, uh, we largely maintain similar kinds of services, but uh, we try to make things more virtual and safe, both for survivors who reach out to us as well as um, our own uh, personnel. So, you know, instead of having a physical call center, you know, everyone work from home, but, uh, you know, calls get directed to to our personnel uh, on their phones at home, for example, um, uh, you know, counseling or or face-to-face -face consultations um, all shifted to either phone or um, virtual uh, uh, interactions, things like this. Um, so, uh, so we we did um, uh, it's fundamentally the same thing, but but I think how how we think about it is one is doing a bit more of what we already do, and number two changing uh, some of our services uh, to become more virtual friendly. And, and I think uh, we have no choice but to maintain uh, these, these changes. Um, you know, we, we don't know how long um, the impacts of uh, COVID and MCO will, will last. Um, and, uh, you know, we're finding, you know, maybe some things do work regardless of and are more efficient to do, it's more efficient to do certain things a certain way. Uh, so for sure, we're, we're looking to, to continue all these efforts that we put in place um, for the foreseeable future.
Okay, great. I mean, that's, that's really interesting to hear because, I mean, what we are hearing is that there has been a very dramatic increase um, in the cases and, you know, WAO has been very flexible and sensitive and sort of readjusting its approach to delivering its services and are foreseeing that this is going to continue for at least the foreseeable future and are keeping that in place. So I wanted to turn the question back to um, the lawyers, um, especially Honey, what sort of changes do you think the legal profession or um, do you expect to see in, in terms of representing vulnerable clients in courts moving forward? Because it's clear that they exist um, and you know, how are we going to sort of support them when even though we are easing into a new normal, but it looks like some restrictions are still going to continue. What are your thoughts on that? Well, actually, at the moment, there's, uh, the judiciary are re-looking at the rules of court, which is basically this bunch of rules that govern how we, we uh, take matters to court. And it's, it's huge, huge amendments. And uh, actually, we don't even know how it's going to turn out yet because we're just at the start of the discussion. But definitely, the judiciary is uh, taking the move forward in terms of um, having more... Um, virtual hearings uh, and and I think that's in a way something that we should embrace um, for me at the moment is actually okay if you want to do something like this for applications which basically means there's no um, witnesses involved huh? so applications are heard by way of affidavit so I I think most everyone is um, in support of that but when it comes to anything with witnesses that it becomes a huge issue. I mean, especially when we want to talk about um, uh, domestic violence in, in relation to, uh, to a divorce matter, for example, right? Um, things which are already happening, the, the imbalance in power between you know, husbands and wives generally, because in Malaysia, we still have husbands earning far more than their wives. Because uh, you still have many wives who are, are, are housewives, um, and and that's quite common because of of so many other uh, so many reasons lah, You know, uh, 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 quite a lot of it is actually also uh, financial because you know if you have two three children, then it, it doesn't make it financially viable for you to go and have like a like a daycare or something. So the problem then is that when you don't have enough money, then what kind of lawyers are you going to get to represent you? So that sort of imbalance happens even when it's like an a in-person hearing, but it, it is exacerbated when it comes to uh, you know, virtual hearings because the, the, I mean, the thing that we call a digital divide, which is how comfortable are you with technology, it's so clear and it it's, uh, it's actually works against women a lot. Uh, um, and, and so on top of the power imbalance, you also have this digital divide issue. Um, because right now when you have hearings and, and uh, you know, if, if you're not in court uh, and you want to get a, even a joint petition, which is a divorce by mutual consent, um, how are you going to do it? So in the Shah Alam High Court at the moment, they are doing it by way of emails. So it's quite unusual, right? I mean, uh, to me, when I think about virtual hearings, I think about audio video. But right now, what's happening is by way of emails. So, are you sure that the parties, especially the, the women, the wives, uh, understand exactly what's going on? Because in under normal circumstances, everything will be heard in open court. There will be an interpreter. So, the, the language issue is a big problem because uh, we are required uh, to actually file our papers in Basel, Malaysia, mostly. Uh, or we have an English translation. So, when the judge wants to inquire, uh, whether you know the provisions are fair, is she getting enough uh, maintenance for herself or her children? Um, you will usually have an interpreter, and you either have a Chinese interpreter or a Tamil interpreter. So there's a toing and froing, and then the judge can satisfy herself that okay, parties understand what is agreed upon, and I can grant the, the divorce. But when you are doing it via email, where is the check and balance? You know, and and that that's uh that's a bit worrying lah. You know, uh, so even even divorce by mutual consent, uh, judges are required by law to inquire and to ask, you know. Um, because another thing that commonly happens is that, you know, both parties will be represented by one lawyer. And most usually, they'll be the lawyer of the husband because he's the one who's more able to pay. So, we're back to this whole, this, this issue of power imbalance manifests itself in so many ways, you know. So, we're all, you know, watching and participating in these changes that are happening with the rules of court. So actually right now, we can't really say because 
I think maybe it was they're just at the first or second round of discussions. Uh, so everyone's kind of like, you know, watching with bated breath to see what's going to happen next. Uh, yeah, but to, to get actually women more up to speed with, with uh, technology is, is so yeah. key now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's really, really fascinating because like you said, there's a lot of um, enthusiasm around technology right now as there should be because that is really the way forward. But of course, we do have to be mindful about people who may be left behind, so to speak. And then of course, you know, a question maybe not for this panel, but to explore wider is how can lawyers also bridge that gap? How can lawyers sort of like sit in that digital divide and help the more vulnerable access justice and in doing so uphold the rule of law. So thank you for that. That was really interesting. Um, Fadlina, from the Sharia court's perspective, do you see similar changes, adoption of technology and any discussion around this digital divide as well? Yes, thank you, Hannah. As I mentioned before, that uh, we've start um, we've started already uh, open the Sharia court to public um, since 9th of uh, June. So we've been running um, here and there since 9th of June. Um, uh, as it's open to public, full service, yeah, uh, Sharia Court, full service to the public. Um, the first, uh, my first observation, uh, of course, uh, for the uh, SOPs um, uh, to avoid uh, physical contact um, SOPs during pandemic. Um, so my observation that uh, the Sharia Court has observed this uh, very, um, I mean, uh, diligently, um, and uh, everybody during the clients um, and the lawyers. Um, uh, a full, uh, a given full uh, operation, cooperation uh, to the SOP. So at the administration, number two is the administration, 50% um, has resorted to uh, online services. So um, uh, uh, we've been resorted to video calls for appointment of lawyers, uh, affidavits, um, even trials. Yeah? So lawyers can choose whether uh, to conduct their trials um, um, by virtual or the normal proceeding, uh, but normal proceeding, we have to observe all the SOPs and night courts. Yeah, uh, so the uh, our chief um, judge has introduced night courts uh, to resume all the proceedings that has been adjourned during MCO. So this uh, three uh, measurement has been taken by the Sharia Court um, to avoid and to control uh, the pandemic as well as uh, to explore on the um, virtual uh, courts. So I have my own. Um, uh, worry uh, like uh, honey uh, <laughs> tells just now. <clears throat> uh, if the parties are represented uh, by lawyers yeah, in Sharia court, the virtual the virtual proceeding should be okay. It's, it's going to be a smooth sailing procedure. But what if uh, she's not or he's not uh, representing uh, by any lawyers? So the technical aspect yeah, um, of uh, the trial uh, should be our main concern, and the access is access to justice. Yeah, virtual court now is the access to justice. Um, and then, um, so far, the virtual uh, proceedings or the virtual trial only limited to mutual divorce and um, divorce that uh, happen outside the court. Uh, so it's not for all. Um, like what Honey told us just now, our worries about um, the case that involve witness. So it's not really um, advisable to proceed with a virtual um, uh, court, a uh, virtual uh, trial. So. Um, and I agree, we have to speed up with the technology, not uh, as uh, not just for our client, but uh, for lawyers as well. Yeah, for lawyers as well. So we have this all this type of Zoom, uh, emails, um, Google Meets, uh, StreamYard, and all of and all these uh, kind of technologies that we have to assimilate and adapt um, as well. So that will be my response. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Fabina. Yeah, I think what's coming out really clearly and really strongly is that if technology, if lawyers are going to uphold their duty to the rule of law and access to justice, they have to get familiar with technology because yes. that's the way of the future. So I think that's a theme that I would like to, to explore um, um, in the future and maybe we can think about that. Um, but Ren Chiang, curious to hear your view and your perspective uh, of this issue from the front lines, um, in particular in the context of this digital divide um, that's being discussed, like what have you seen? I think it's, it's definitely an important point. I, I, think, uh, I think Hani's overarching point of um, even looking at gender disparities within um, the digital sphere, I think it, it is, um, needs to be on the back of our minds when we talk about moving digital. Uh, in fact, the UN, um, uh, UN Women, I believe, put out a report um, last week or two weeks ago, precisely on this, noting that uh, for various reasons, 
uh, women's access to uh, online services um, or just online space generally um, shouldn't be it, it, it shouldn't be taken as granted as, as equal to, to men. Uh, and just one example is um, you know due to um, uh, women women tend to face more harassment online, and this then limits uh, their access not only to um, online services because they just don't want to be in that space. Um, it also uh, just accesses, uh, it, it also affects their, their ability to um, uh, just be social, to keep in touch with, uh, you know, maintain a social presence online, uh, uh, be in touch with friends and family. Uh, so I think that has to be at the back of our mind when we're thinking about moving uh, digital. Uh, and of course, access to internet uh, it, itself, we look at that, I think we'll, we'll, uh, this is sort of globally, not necessarily speaking on Malaysia. Uh, women less access to internet compared to men. So these are simple uh, points I think that that we need to bear in mind. Um, that being said, yeah, it's it's some of these things are inevitable. Um, uh, and some of these things would you know they, they would have uh, 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 we can't help but move to a bit more uh, uh, at least a digital alternative. I think is the idea. Um, so uh, you know I think it's it's still it's the verdict out there as to what exactly you know the world's going to look like. Uh, undoubtedly, it's going to be more virtual. Um, and I think the challenge for us is to ensure that, you know, as we, as we make this um, change, um, for sure things, some things will be okay and even better. Um, but uh, access to technology, I mean, that's, you know, uh, universal human right under the uh, UN Declaration of um, Human Rights. Um, uh, that the ability to access equally, we can't, can't forget about that. We have to ensure that uh, we'll bring everyone along, especially uh, those who are more, um, uh, who, who need it the most. Yeah, that's, that's very fascinating. Thank you for, for sharing that perspective. I mean, I, we were not intending for this conversation to head into the technology realm, but it does seem almost inevitable when you're talking in the context of imbalance in um, power and technology is a tool um, to power. And it would be very interesting to see how lawyers can support themselves in technology in order to equip their clients and the more vulnerable in, in, this, in this area as well. Um, so we've, I've come to the end of my questions and I'd very much like to sort of throw it open to the floor to the attendees that are tuning in. Um, if there are any questions, I'd be interested um, to, to field them. So currently we don't have any open questions. Um, so we'll just give it a couple of, of minutes. Um, and perhaps while waiting, I can ask one of my own burning questions that have come up in the course of this discussion, um, in, in particular in the realm of, I guess, here we are back at, you know, technology and access to justice. Like, you know, what are the lawyers sort of doing to sort of, you know, equip themselves, um, particularly from an access to justice mindset? Um, you know, perhaps the lawyers can sort of uh, chime in and maybe run through, maybe you can talk about what you'd like to see um, in order for legal services to be more effectively delivered to um, victims of domestic violence. I yeah, think we, we'll find that uh, quite a few lawyers and their clients now work on WhatsApp. Uh, and, and that's really important because I think the old days of, uh, you know, having clients only contact you via your office phone, I think those days are practically, you know, gone. So the, the issue then will be um, how do you even communicate, especially women who are in distress, um, how do you, it, it, it's, it's kind of like a weird world, you know, because when you're face to face and you are listening to your client and mm -hmm. they can, in that sense, like, uh, they can see your empathy and they can uh, hear the concerns. So the combination of audio visual is, is really important. And I found that during the, the MCO, CMCO period, uh, it was, it was just kind of impossible to have any video uh, contact because if you have any calls, before 8.30, it will be fine. The minute you hit 8.30 a.m. plus until, you know, whatever time, you sometimes you couldn't even make WhatsApp calls. So when you want to talk about technology, one of the key things that we have to talk about is the service providers. Can they actually provide stable and, and good connection for us? So, yeah, so I try and schedule then all my calls like, 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, you know, um, and, and, and do that. So, I mean, this, this is a beyond law kind of discussion. So, um, you, you need whoever is doing all the service providing so that even if you want to do like, you know, uh, virtual hearings for courts and all that, that that's another struggle, uh, you know, uh, and, yeah. um, 
who knows where that's going to lead. 5G, I'm not sure even what that is, but come, come now. A stable connection. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's that's definitely, real oh. definitely some like bigger questions than what the legal community can, can sort of address. But uh, Renchung, you were going to say something. Please continue. Yeah, I think maybe there are two points to add. So one um, uh, sort of uh, going, touching a little bit back on what our discussion on um, digital divide. Um, and one of the things that we need to do, um, maybe not lawyers per se, but just um, uh, but law, uh, it relates to lawmaking, is to ensure that our legal system adequately uh, provides a baseline protection for everyone to engage uh, in the online sphere. Uh, I think we've seen throughout the MCO um, um, uh, increasing concerns about online harassment, um, online uh, doxing, surveillance, um, us, and, and frankly, our in Malaysia at least, our um, legal system is not adequately set up to provide the protection and redress necessary for these uh, for people experience such um, uh, acts. Uh, Honey alluded to this earlier uh, when she brought up um, uh, the absence of anti-stalking laws in, in Malaysia, and, and this is something that um, it, 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 it's a huge gap in terms of. Um, legal protection for violence against women uh, in Malaysia. It, it relates to domestic violence in the sense that, you know, uh, uh, if you're an unmarried partner, for example, um, you are not protected by domestic violence laws. So if you're abused by a boyfriend, um, uh, although the police can arrest your boyfriend if, 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 if uh, he hits you, um, but there's no protection mechanism for you. You cannot access um, uh, protection orders that are available under domestic violence act. Uh, if the incident has not escalated to some kind of physical abuse or clear threat, uh, you may not even be able to get police to investigate um, uh, or, or give you any kind of help. Uh, and that's why we really need to enact anti-stalking, anti-harassment laws. Uh, it's not a complicated thing. Uh, this is something that is becoming increasingly mainstream across the world. Um, uh, these are laws that have been, have been adopted in Singapore, in the UK, um, in India, uh, various parts of the US, Australia, and, and many other um, jurisdictions in the region. Um, and, 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 you know, uh, for Malaysia, we're not there yet, but uh, the good news is um, uh, we're, we're, we're almost there. Uh, I think uh, so, so there was an interministerial uh, committee led by the Legal Affairs Division in the Prime, Prime Minister's office that had actually convened everyone. Uh, uh, various ministries and stakeholders, and to draft uh, this, these laws. So it's simple amendments to the penal code, to the criminal procedure code. And, and this thing is waiting for the cabinet to just get it, really. Uh, and because of the instability, because of uh, what is going on, these things have, have actually stalled. So I mean, this is one point for me. I think as, as just as citizens, we, should, we ought to be pushing for lawmakers to enact these kinds of laws. So, so anti-stalking, anti-harassment laws is something that can is I, so Can I just easy. add something here? Um, okay, the, the, the thing about us, Malaysia, is that uh, we're a common law country. So, I mean, like Renchung and I and, and a few others, we're all working on the stalking laws. But because we are a common law country, judges also make law. So, right now, our sexual harassment law is judge-made. Uh, there's, a, there's a case called Boma Rizwan at the federal court. The federal court decided to create a tort of sexual harassment. So that's one way to do it. So best way, I would say, always is statute because it's clearer. But if not, and thank God we're a common law country, we can have judge-made law. So right now, uh, we are actually, we have filed a, a matter in the, in the high court and we are testing the law and we are trying to get the judge to find and make a law on stalking. So... Let's see how that goes. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, unfortunately, we've come to the end of the, our time. We did have two questions come in actually, um, that uh, three questions actually, that um, maybe we can speak to the panelists separately to see how we want to respond to that. Um, but I am respectful of everybody's time. So I'd like to thank the panelists once again for your time and for sharing and for all that wisdom. And thank you for the attendees for sitting through the entire session and for your questions at the end. Um, so we'll thank be you, having everyone. more of these. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you, Ren. Thank you, honey. Thank you, Lexis. <laughs> Thank you, Lexis. Yes, thank you, Lexis. You're most welcome.
All right. Bye, everyone. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye. bye.